good starting place for this message is to start where a fair number of women already are. I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. I've not heard of anyone here say this, but I've heard it other places. I've heard it all my life. You read about it. The number one complaint that wives report having about their husbands is not that they're physically abusive, though some are. Uh, it's not that they drink too much, though some do. There's something more common than that. There's something that is more universal than that. And you find it at all ages and stages in marriages. You know what the wife's number one complaint is? My husband is passive. My husband is passive. Uh, he, it's like he's tame. Uh, now he's very compliant. And on one level, I like that. I like, women like compliance, or they should, in a way. Men sure like compliance. And yet, when a woman has a husband who is uh, compliant, tame, passive, leaves all the decisions to her, on one level, she may appreciate that because that gives her a lot of power, gives her more leverage. But on a deeper level, while she may love a husband like that, she will not respect him. What's going on when you have a grown man in his 20s or in his 80s who is indecisive, can't seem to make decisions, um, and if he makes a decision, he can't seem to stick with it, and he, for whatever reason, just cannot seem to take the lead And he can't seem to stand up and fight the fights and do the battles that often need to be fought in a family life. For, for one thing, we're not talking about negative, unhealthy fights. We're not talking about meanness. We're talking about, for example, fighting for your marriage. When a marriage is not what it ought to be, and you got a woman who's willing to fight for it, to do whatever's necessary, why is it that so many men don't fight for it? And what about when kids <laughs> begin to cause problems, especially as they get older? And if they're normal, they're gonna hit some streak of rebellion of some kind. Sometimes, and a certain amount of that, by the way, is not only normal, it's healthy and necessary. It's, it's an unpleasant, it's kind of like puberty. It's, a, it's an awkward, unpleasant phase that's just part of growing up. But it can get out of hand. What happens when a husband, father, cannot bring himself to fight for the child. I don't mean fight with the child, but to fight for the child. To make tough decisions, to set boundaries, to, 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 to either take the lead or at least stand firm with his wife, united, on a game plan for resolving whatever kind of problems we've got, financial, relational, spiritual, whatever. Why is that? Well, let me say, first off, I'm sure there are multitudes of reasons. Everybody's unique. We all have our unique past. We were all formed and shaped in unique ways by 
a variety of different people. But if I have to identify the one most common reason that many men, especially today, in today's culture, cannot be assertive when they need to be assertive. You know, the Bible says there's, I quote this all the time, there's a time for everything, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to search with everything you got. And there's a time to give up as lost. Time for everything. One reason so many men in, in our culture can't seem to ever recognize when it's time to fight. When it's time for a war, I'm not talking about holy war. I'm not talking about uh, a war of aggression. I'm talking about standing up, fighting for the marriage, fighting for the family, pushing through the difficulties of work and making a living, fighting for the protection and provision of the children. Part of it is that there's something that God put into men. It's in there, but it has to be activated. You know, there are all sorts of abilities, potentials within all of us that are there. They were there when we were babies. But if those potentials, if those powers, if those gifts are not pointed out by some older, wiser men, if they're not activated, encouraged, and instructed, they tend to lie dormant. And so, so many men live these lives where they're just passive spectators on their own story. And that can be very frustrating to a wife. And when the kid's growing up, it's probably not gonna frustrate the kid that much. Though you could make the argument that every kid in a way wants to have some structure, even though they say they don't. But if a man lives his life as a passive spectator, when his midlife comes, what, when you hear midlife, crisis. yeah, crisis. Uh, again, those are complicated things that happen for different reasons, but there's one central reason. If a man has lived his life, if he's done marriage and family, and even his work as sort of this passive observer who just kind of goes along with whatever. At some point, usually at midlife, he's going to begin recognizing something's missing in me. Or, though he may not have the words for it, something in him that should have been activated and cultivated was either suppressed or completely ignored and therefore it never developed. And you, you know, you, the, the classic thing you hear, midlife, men go crazy and get a red sports car and they, uh, they get sunglasses and start going to the tanning bed and uh, get a, get a uh, what do you call it, fat belt and all this kind of stuff. And you know, Deep down what that's all about is that they recognize that in the earlier stage of life when they should have been doing all that stuff, for whatever reason, they did not. Nobody gave them permission. Nobody told them they could or that they should. And when you get to midlife and out in the distance, you can see 
the end and you realize there are big areas of life where you've just not shown up it creates a certain amount of craziness and you know what this may surprise you to go crazy in midlife and I don't mean insane I mean for Amanda for a man to sort of come alive and recognize he's missed out on some opportunities, very important opportunities. He may do some crazy things trying to, in his own probably afflicted way, trying to make up for it. But you know what? Sometimes midlife crisis is actually the last call or, don't say it, the last call to become the person God made you to be in the beginning. Now, why would any boy, any boy growing into manhood, why would he not grow into an independent man? who can take care of himself, he can be responsible, and when necessary, he can defend, he can protect, he can do what men need to do. Uh, what are some of the reasons, how does this happen? Part of it, oh, I hate to say it, but I'll, I'll preface it this way. Ladies, mothers, I'm sure you did not do what I'm about to describe. Okay? So we're talking about somebody else's mama, okay? But did you know, have you ever noticed, that there are mothers who cannot let go of their boys? You know what I'm talking about. Mothers who cannot let go of their boys. Uh, they carried that boy in the womb, for nine months, he was part of her. And I'm told by, I mean, I'm not told, I've read psychologists and neuroscientists say that in the, especially the first year of life, not the second, if, if not into the second, a, a child, boy or girl, can hardly distinguish himself or herself from the mother. They're just like, they're that closely bonded. Let me say this very carefully. That is a good thing. That is the way God made it. That's natural. That's normal. But to everything there is a season. And during that season, what is essential for growing a healthy, strong, secure child, boy or girl, if that season passes and the mother keeps operating in such a way that the boy can't leave and cleave, if you know what I mean. He can't leave the mother and go cleave to his wife. If he can't leave the mother and go out into the world, the larger world of men, it's, it, you know what happens? The womb becomes the tomb where a man's spirit dies um, the goal in raising children you know this but let me remind you our goal is not to keep them forever children our goal is to train and raise them in such a way where they won't need us anymore But strangely, some mothers and some fathers too, part of them wants to do that, and yet there's something that doesn't want to let go, that wants to keep them close, a little too close. And that's, and that's bad for everybody, because eventually the roles need to reverse. Because sooner or later, even the youngest mothers here who will soon be dedicating their children uh, sometime in the next month or so right now that baby's dependent on you 
But here's something that you can scarcely even imagine right now, though it's totally true. The day will come when you'll be completely dependent on that baby. There has to be a role reversal. The one who is nurtured and protected has to first become independent, responsible, and yes, assertive. You ever tried to, you ever been involved in trying to take the keys away from somebody, from a person who no longer needs to be driving? You gotta be assertive. Uh, and a, a, a young man and a young woman have to grow into that. Without it, there's failure to thrive. You know, failure to thrive, that's a term that you often hear about infants. Uh, like an infant is sick in the neo, neonatal unit and the medical folks say there's a failure to thrive. And so they do everything they can to get this child healthy, get him home, give him a normal life. That's one form of failure to thrive. And that kind of failure to thrive, the way to treat it is to nurture, care, even pamper the child. But once that season passes, if that pampering and nurturing and that holding too close continues, guess what else? There'll be an adult version of failure to thrive. God's made everything beautiful in its time. So, I mentioned earlier that this is especially common in our current culture. Larger, I'm not all men for sure, but larger and larger numbers of men who are passive and very compliant, they're, they're really nice. When I say that this is common in our culture, I don't want you to, I don't want your mind to go in the wrong direction. It's way too common to hear preachers and other, other people talk about, well, these days, everything's worse. Everything's going to the dogs. That's false. There are things in our day that are not as good as they once were, but there are just as many other things that are better than they ever were before. Don't get caught up in all that negativity. The, when I say there are more males today than probably ever before who don't thrive, who remain passive and compliant and can't lead, can't fight for their families, it, it, it's because we've lost a a, a tradition that was part of every ancient culture. They understood the importance of it. It was high priority. And when I say ancient culture, I'm talking everything from the earliest tribes you read about in Genesis and Exodus. I'm talking about the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians. I'm talking about the the American Indians, and I'm talking about Europeans until about the last few hundred years, here's what was always present, because everybody knew, everybody knew something about young men. The young man has the God-given potential to become a leader, responsible and when necessary fight for what he's in charge of respecting of, of, of protecting but people have always known that does not just automatically happen with every boy now we're speaking in general generalities there are a few boys who are just such macho men from day one that you almost have to hold them back a little bit. But generally speaking, something has to happen to activate that in a man, in a young man. And so there have always been rites of passage. You could call them rituals or initiation. 
And the goal of the initiation, though, it, though the details vary from one culture and time and place to another, and here's the pattern. Something has to happen that actually pulls the boy out from under his mother's skirt and initiates him into the world of men. Something has to happen in order to help him make those transitions. And it's especially important in early life, but it, there are transitions throughout life. I want to give you an example. Um, I read recently about a tribe of Australian Aborigines. And this particular tribe was one of the few remaining tribes on earth that's not been westernized that's not taken on our culture to such a degree that they've lost much of what they once had it's the tribe of aborigines who still practices the right of initiating young men separating them from their mothers again now not so they'll grow up and hate their mothers Ooh, no 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 but so they can recognize my mother is my mother, I'm me. She protected me, and if I'm gonna now become her protector, something's gotta change. And so in this, in this particular tribe, here's what the Aborigines do. When a young man turns 12 years old, the men of the village, some of whom he knows, some who don't, they come to his little wiki up or whatever it is they live in where he and his mother are living and the men come with their faces painted as if for war and they drag the boy out because they say it's time for your circumcision you know most of the time circumcisions happen when you're a few days old eight days old can you imagine that when you're 12? That would hurt. We'll leave it at that. Why do that then? Well, he's about to enter puberty. He's about to be responsible for his own sexuality, his own decisions. And the truth is nobody, nobody, whatever age or sex or stage of life, Nobody really changes without a certain degree of pain being involved. I hate pain, but I have transformed and grown more through painful experiences than I ever did comforting experiences. So it's very painful and it's very terrifying to the young man. And here's what the mother does in this tradition of the Aborigines. When the men come, she begins screaming. She knows what's going on, by the way. I mean, they've been doing this for thousands of years. She knows what's happening, but she, she screams. She, she, she kind of goes through the motions of trying to save the boy from these awful men, but she fails, and something snaps in his head. My mother is no longer my protector. As long as a boy sees his mother as his protector, he's going to be passive and he'll probably marry a woman and expect her to be his protector. There's got to be something has to break the power of that. So she can't protect him. They take him off, they initiate him, they circumcise him. In many cultures, a young man is sent off, you know this from Native American history, probably the Indians, American Indians, generally would send a young man off on uh, some sort of vision quest, some, an ordeal of some sort that was gonna be very painful, very strenuous, very difficult. It was going to, it was going to push him beyond anything he ever thought he was capable of doing. 
And he's going to discover on this vision quest, for example, was you cannot come back for two moons and all you're taking with you is a knife. Um, but that separation from the mother, that forced independence, you're either going to discover how to make it on your own or you're not going to make it. Now, are they trying to kill the boy? Is that the goal? Heck no. They're actually trying to develop the boy into a man who won't get himself killed. A man who can be resourceful and do what has to be done. Um, and uh, speaking of uh, Native Americans, I'll give you two quick examples and then two biblical examples. I, don't worry, we're coming to some scripture. It just comes later in the message. I want to give you a couple of Indian chief names that you've heard of. These were, these were uh, war chiefs, both of them. They were known for their bravery. One was Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse led the Sioux and Cheyenne and Arapaho combined forces at the Battle of Little Bighorn that annihilated Custer and the Seventh Cavalry. Crazy Horse. Well, did you know that in traditional societies, biblical and American Indians, and I'm sure other places around the world, a child is given a name at birth, but that's usually expected to be a temporary name until the child earns a name of his or her own. Until the child displays some character, characteristic or some strength that, that, that does a good job of describing who he actually is. Just think about it. When you, when you name a kid, you have no idea who you're dealing with yet. Uh, that's why when I get a new horse, I, I never name the horse for at least three months. Because it takes that long to discover, I just got a new mare and I just had her three months just now named her the other day. It takes a while to discover who they are, what they're made of. Same thing in the ancient world. Crazy horse, you know what is, that's a pretty, that's a wild name. You know what his original given name was? Curly. <laughs> Curly. But when Crazy Horse went on his vision quest, when the men of the village pushed him out into the wilds, often having to fast, whether you plan to or not, because they can only scrounge up so much food, fasting has always been known to help initiate visions. And Crazy Horse, according to one account, there are many accounts, but this is the account I read back in sixth grade on a biography of Crazy Horse, so this is the one that's true, okay? If it ain't, it ought to be. The story goes that Crazy Horse on his vision quest fell into hunger, he lost consciousness, he had a vision, and what he envisioned was a large number of horses whirling around in a circle. A large number of horses whirling around this center and it seemed to be a war scene. Whirling horses, translated crazy horse. Well, some say that was some sort of spiritual glimpse of his greatest triumph as a man, which was circling the seventh cavalry. But he, he, he discovered that name on his, in his ordeal. He discovered who he was, and then he lived up to that name. Similar thing with Geronimo. I think he, I've always liked Geronimo because he was the last wild American Indian to surrender. At the time he surrendered, he had less than 10 braves left. And uh, he was always quite the warrior, wolf of the war path, they call him. But uh, his name, his given name as a little boy was Goyali. Goyali. 
And you know what that means? Talk about passive. Goyali means he who yawns. Oh. See, the, see that? Well, when he became a young man, he distinguished himself as a hunter, as a raider, and at the time he was young, the battles were not with American soldiers. They had not yet appeared. It was with Mexican cavalry. And they won most of the battles, most all of them, and it is said that these were, these were Spaniards, they had a Catholic background, and you know there's a, a saint, the saints play a role in Catholicism, especially years ago they did. And um, when they realized it was this particular band led by that Goyali, which they didn't understand, they would begin praying and screaming out to St. Jerome. And the, of course the Apaches had no idea what they were talking about, but that Jerome stuck in the way they wound up pronouncing it was Geronimo. Now real quickly, a couple from the Bible. Abraham, God changed Abraham's name, not as a young man, Remember the initiation, the transition to the next phase can come later in life. For Abram, it happened when he was 99. Before his wife conceived the son Isaac, it was when he first and finally actually began to trust God's promise. Now Abram meant father, simply meant father. He was the father of one child, Ishmael. But then God changed his name as he saw Abram's faith developing. He changed it to Abraham. You know what that means? The father of many nations and tribes. And one you're more familiar with, perhaps Jacob. His born name, Jacob. His actually fit him. Heel catcher, deceiver. But... When he was in midlife, he had a midlife crisis. Uh, he wouldn't have known that name, but that's what it amounted to, because he found himself, he spent all of his life deceiving, dodging, never really dealing directly with anything. I wouldn't call him a passive person. I would say Jacob was passive aggressive, basically. But on the night before he knew he was gonna have to meet his old brother Esau, and he'd already heard that Esau was coming to meet him with 400 men. For the first time, there was nowhere to run. And you know what the Bible says. Jacob sent all his flocks, his family, his children, his wives across the river and stayed alone on the banks of the Jabba River. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. That was his ordeal. That was his initiation. Something shifted in him so significantly because for the first time in his life, he was no longer conniving, avoiding, dodging, tripping people up. He was wrestling. And the next morning, God said to him, your name shall no longer be Jacob. Your name will be Israel. A prince with power with God for you've struggled with men and with God and you've prevailed. The new name comes with the new identity. But all these, all these men, the young ones, the older ones, in every generation has to eventually encounter something dangerous, something risky without mama and daddy there to protect. That's why the military is a great thing for a lot of young men. Because for many young men, that's the first time they've had to do that. Uh, there are other ways to do it. It can happen in athletics. When you got this mean coach who pushes you way beyond your limit, who makes you run till you throw up, and mama might be over on the sidelines 
fussing about it and screaming at him, but he doesn't pay her any attention any more than the aborigines pay attention to the mother of the 12-year-old. Something has to happen that pushes a person beyond their limits. They leave and cleave. Now, I gotta give you a quick story. This is a true story, totally true. It's not literally true, it's just true. In fact, some of the most true stories, true to life, true to describing human experience, are not literally true, but boy, they're slim, packed with true insight, called Iron John. It was popularized by Robert Bly years ago, 20 years ago now, in his book, which was called Iron John, a book about men. Well, the story goes, let me be quick. Once there was a little boy whose father was a king, his mother was a queen. He lived in a splendid palace, the magic kingdom. He was pampered, he was taken care of very carefully. After all, we can't let anything happen to him. We gotta protect him. He's gonna be the, the next heir, plus, plus his mother, nurtured him, but she never really stopped nurturing, if you know what I mean. Well, one day, the king's men who were out hunting in the forest happened to capture a wild man. And when I say wild man, I mean wild. Uh, like he'd been raised by the wolves or something. He had long, scraggly red hair all over his body. Almost didn't need clothes. He, had some, he was so hairy and wild, matted hair. Uh, and they captured this wild man somehow. It took 10 of them to hold him down, but they managed to get him into a cage and they put the cage right in the palace yard so that people could walk by and gawk at this wild man. Well, one day the little prince was out in the yard and he was playing with his ball, playing ball, and his ball rolled inside the cage of Iron John. Iron John was the wild man's name. Iron, because, you know, red, iron turns orange, it's red when it rusts. Iron John, they called him. His ball rolled into the cage of the wild man. The little boy went to the cage, keeping his distance, said, give me my ball back. My daddy's the king, you know. My mother's the princess. Give me the king, give me the ball, give me the ball. And Iron John said, I'll tell you what, son, I'll give you your ball back if you'll go get the key to unlock my cage. Well, that scared the little boy at the thought of unlocking the cage of this wild man. And he said, well, I don't even know where the key is. How can I go get it for you? You know what Iron John said? Oh, I'll tell you where it is. The key that unlocks my cell is under your mother's pillow. There's a lot of truth there. The key that kept the wild man confined was hidden under the mother's pillow. Well, the little boy wanted the ball, so he, he slipped into the house. Nobody was around, parents were away. Looked under the pillow, sure enough, there was a key. He brought it, he unlocked Iron John. Iron John, the wild man, immediately thanked him and left, headed toward the woods. And just as Iron John was about to disappear into the woods, the little boy just felt something drawing him, something he'd never felt before and he didn't understand it. But it was so different from anything he'd ever felt in his sheltered little world. And he said, wait, wait, Iron John. Can I go with you? Please take me with you. Please take me with you. I want to go where you're going, into the wilds. Iron John stopped and said, come on then. Prop the little boy, the little prince on his shoulder, and into the forest they went and lived there for several years. Iron John raised the boy. And when he was old enough and initiated enough and strong enough and tough enough and bold enough and assertive enough to be a real leader, he went back to the palace and became king. But as he was leaving that day, Iron John at the edge of the forest said, hey son, remember one thing, I'll always be here, 
And if you ever find yourself needing guts, if you ever find yourself in trouble and you're afraid and you feel like you just need some true grit, all you got to do is come to the edge of the forest and call and I'll come and I'll help you. Now let me say something very true. There really is a wild man, an Iron John, who's not always accepted by polite society. Usually not. He's a threat because he's a nonconformist. But there's an Iron John doesn't live in the woods. He lives in you, son. He lives in you, man. And he does not need to run your life or, or you'll wreck your life. But there are times when you have to call Iron John up in order to be what you need to be and do what you need to do. And Jesus had to start doing that from the beginning. If ever a mother was proud of her baby boy, it was Mary. If anybody ever wanted to protect him, it was Mary. When Jesus was 12 years old, the Bible says they took him to the temple. They got ready to leave. They traveled half day's journey. They got ready to make camp and Jesus wasn't there when they counted all the children. One was missing, it was Jesus. Oh, they were frantic, naturally, especially Mary. But Mary and Joseph rushed back into the city searching they were, finally went to the temple. You know what Jesus was doing? He was sitting there talking to the elders teachers those were some of his first mentors by the way he sought them out uh, Luke 2 49 let me show you what he said to them we can get that on the screen he said to them why did you seek me did you not know I must be about my father's business let that sink in he had just done a no no 12 year old boys are supposed to stay close to their parents and Generally speaking, I hope they do. But in this case, he was drawn to the elders who were some of his first mentors, and he needed that. He sought that. Uh, uh, you could say this too. We have a shortage of elders today. Got plenty of elderly people, but elders, an elder is somebody whether male or female, who has faced real life, who hasn't been protected, who's fought the lion and the bear and the serpent and, the, and they've dealt with the harsh things of life and they've learned and they've grown. Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. He was taking the fatherly role away, away the parental role away from his parents and he was giving it to God. And he was, I must be about his business. He was essentially saying, Mama, uh, here's the deal. Uh, I've got to take care of my business. You go take care of your business. And he did not apologize. You know what he just did? He took the key from under his mother's pillow. And then later, John chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, another time came when he was about to enter a new phase of life. New phase of life, new transition. And once again, his mother was still, bless her heart. You know, by the way, if you ever want to say something negative about somebody, you know this. You just, all you got to do is start the phrase, bless her heart. And then you can say whatever you want. Okay? Bless her heart. When they ran out of wine, this is at Cana of Galilee, she said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman? Not mother. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Mama, I've, I've got a mission here and I know what it is. And I can't.
can't allow anybody to divert it, me from it. Not even you. Not as much as I love you. I can't let you do that. I've got to do this the way I need to do it. Once again, took that key from his mother's, from under his mother's pillow. And did you know that after this, the Mary, his brothers and sisters, early in his ministry, they thought he lost his mind. They didn't, they didn't understand what he was doing or why. In Mark chapter 3, verse 21, Mark 3, verse 21, his family, he was teaching, he was healing, had a vast crowd there. He was doing the work. He was doing what God put him here to do. He was living out of his true self. But when his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. Basically, they wanted to bring him back home. He's going to embarrass himself and us. He's out of his mind, they said. One more scripture, Matthew 12, 46. Here's where you see Jesus has completely become his own person, making his own value judgments in relation to God, not the family of origin. Let me read that, verse 46. Once again, he was teaching. Uh, next one. As, as we're getting there, let me say this. Let me be very clear. The Bible says, honor your father and mother. Period. Period. No exceptions. Nobody would question, nobody should question that. The question is, what does that mean at various stages of life? At one stage, it means you do what they say. As you move into adulthood, listen very carefully. You do not honor your mother or father as an adult by doing everything they think you ought to do. Or trying to be whatever it is they think you ought to be. If anything, you'll wind up dishonoring them because that may well lead you to dishonor the mission that God's given you. Now, uh, we're after, uh, I may have called the wrong scripture, but I'm after Matthew 12, 46 through 50. Let me just summarize. I, I'm, I'm, I gotta summarize quickly anyway. Uh, Jesus was teaching. Somebody came as a messenger and said, Jesus, interrupted. Hey, your mother, your brothers, and your sisters are out there and they want to speak to you. As if you're supposed to stop your teaching here, leave off on what you're doing, go out and see what your mama wants. And you know what Jesus did? He turned to the crowd and he looked around and he said, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? My brothers, my mother, my sister, are they that do the will of God? He's not trying to dishonor his mother. He's doing the very thing that the angel told his mother from the beginning he was here to do. He took the key. Now, Jesus was no passive man. A passive man can't lead anybody anywhere because he doesn't know where he's going. That, that part of you, that iron john, that wild part of you has to be called upon sometime. Sometimes you have to do something that goes against the opinions of other people. You have to say things that others may not approve of, even your own family, in order to actually live into the mission God has given you. Sometimes you gotta go to the forest edge, so to speak. You call up Iron John. He's there when you need it. Sometimes you gotta do the thing you're afraid of doing. Maybe even the thing that's a no-no. And so, man, I want to give you not only permission, but I want to give you 
a challenge. Don't settle for being just whatever it was mama wanted you to be, however well-meaning she may have been. She taught you some good things. Learn to hold on to those. But everything that your parents thought you needed to be and society thinks you ought to be are not always what you were put here by God to do. Take the key from your mother's pillow. Stand up. Leave. Get it done.